folks, we're almost at that starting hour, and we are so glad to see you with us here tonight as we gather for part two of this exciting adventure with Mr. Wesley as he follows the call of God in his life and as he comes alive spiritually. So tonight you're in for a real treat. The first part of his life is quite an adventure. The second part is amazing as God uh, empowers him to start what became a revival throughout England and beyond. And we are the recipients of that revival so many years later. The fruit is still being produced. You will know, you will know a good tree by its fruit. And here we are. The fruit is still being produced, thanks be to God. So we are glad to have you with us tonight. I pray that you will sense the presence and the power of God as we enjoy this time together. Uh, scripture tonight comes out of Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. And, and give the pastor a minute to get his glasses. <laughs> this print is very small. And my eyes are not what they used to be. <clears throat> We will start again. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Let us pray together. Father, what a, what a wonderful opportunity it is to be together tonight to be not just in worship, but in a learning mode as we learn from Dr. Tom Fuller about who John Wesley was, how you worked in his life, what kind of legacy he has left, and how we can uh, learn from him, be inspired by him, especially the way you, the living God, worked in his life and through his life. And we want the same to happen in our lives we pray that you would fill us full to the brim with your holy spirit we pray that you would use us to be a blessing and encouragement in the lives of others we too pray for awakenings and revival right here in the panhandle and across oklahoma and this wonderful nation of ours we long for our nation to turn back to you to seek your face um, and so we want to be a part of that it's not just a pipe dream. Lord, we are working for that. We are praying for that. We are trusting you for that each and every day. And so we come tonight to learn, to receive, to grow, so that we can be vessels of honor, fit for your use. I pray your anointing upon Tom as he shares. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. May we have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church tonight. We offer you ourselves as living sacrifices in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And sing, Revive Us Again. <clears throat> See you go. 
may be seated if Mac and Lanny will come and receive our offering for us again tonight. Dr. Tom Fuller is an appointed evangelist and he is not on a salary so what we give helps support him and his family and invests in his ministry so we are glad to be a part of that. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus we remember your challenge that as we give in the measure we give we will receive and as we receive from you we receive abundantly pressed down and shaken together and running over in our laps and we have received in such measure from you grace upon grace your forgiveness your love your daily provision you have been incredibly good to us and for that we are so very grateful and so tonight as we give, we pray your richest blessing upon Tom and his family, upon his ministry. And Lord, we are a, we are a grateful part of what you are accomplishing through his life. Bless the gift, bless the giver. We give in Jesus' name. Amen. sing our doxology praise God from whom all blessing flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above you heavenly host praise father son and Holy. You may be seated. You're good. You stand right where you are. You're fine. The things of this world that are dear to my heart, they just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus, only let me use them to brighten my way. So remind me 
Remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the nail prints in his hands. But he chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why he loves me, I can't understand. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Sing that chorus with me. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Well, we are delighted to have Tom Fuller with us. I've said each service, uh, Tom is knowledgeable. He has studied Wesley for decades. He has served as a pastor and evangelist and has a passion to share. But what I like or love most about him is he's a Christ follower. He has patterned his life on Jesus. He wants to be like him. Thank you. And so uh, without any further introduction, Tom. I almost thought you were going to do a duet for us, Sandy. You and uh, Esther standing there hand in hand. and humble he sought common folk and the scholars they marveled whenever he spoke the people before him their wounded they laid each soul
Then unlike other rabbis, he touched with his hand the adulteress, the outcast, and the leprous man who was the strange healer who broke all their rules, who said children were wise and their teachers were fools. Well, we can't go round telling such unguarded truth and expect then to live many years past our youth. So their soft-spoken healer they cornered and killed. And so doing the words of their prophets fulfilled. If he were to come back today, would we want to be healed as he passed by our way? When he said, take your pallet, now stand up and walk, would we or remain with the beggars and talk when his critics closed in would we stand by his side would we pray in the garden be arrested and tried or in fear would we him to Calvary go. All alone as he did such a long time ago. A healer came walking our streets long ago. If he came back, how would his disciples he know? I'm just <laughs> falling apart. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know how we get vexed with demons and other things. <laughs> and I promise I've been to the doctor. He said, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, well, maybe nothing that you can detect. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, um, I haven't said anything about books except for my John Wesley Express, that uh, blue book. I hope some of you will study that after I leave. It's if you if John Wesley fascinates you, uh, I, there's a whole lot more that I can't even begin to talk about. But I uh, read a bunch of books and I compiled them, the most interesting parts down to a thing that I called the John Wesley Academy, and it was like 400 pages long. <laughs> that was I had, couldn't get it any smaller than that. I thought, and um, one lady held it up and said, "I could be dead before we finish this." <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> that was the first comment I heard on that, on that. I said, well, that would defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? It was 24 lessons. So I went back and I cut it down even more into 12 lessons. And, uh, and uh, 
three months or at least. And so that's why I call it the express because you get through it in a hurry before you die. <laughs> and uh, so, so anyway, that those are out there, and I hope some of you will do that. I hope you'll also study my Bible study, Raise Up the Remnant, which is new. It's a year old, and, and I'm going to give that to you, brother. And also, I wrote this, Let's Grow Up something I never really learned to do myself, but I grew older, but not up. And uh, this is a bunch, uh, it's, it's subtitled, um, uh, let's see, what is it subtitled? <laughs> I don't even have glasses. <laughs> Hidden treasures, would you hold this so I can read it? <laughs> Hidden treasures in the, in the New Testament Greek uh, about seriously following Jesus. There's just, a, Greek is so much huger than than English, and uh, like there's 11 words for to see. There's to see, which we can't do very well, and there's <gasps> to see, and, and, uh, and a bunch of others, and, and they're all used differently. We have just one word, and, and uh, you know, like a, a word, a love is agape, and philia, and eros, and storgeo, and, and well, there, there are many words that are that way, and that's why no English translation is really accurate. It's, uh, it's, it's just, too, they're all too simple. Yes, even the King James. All right. Um, I know that's a shock to some, but uh, <laughs> but that's, Paul uses, that's, <laughs> that's right. If you want a Jesus who speaks like a Shakespearean actor, well, fine, do the King James. <laughs> but that's how he would have spoken in 1600 in England. But <laughs> anyway, but that's not how he spoke back then. He 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 used Koine, or at least the New Testament was in Koine or Common Greek, which is Street Greek. And uh, uh, and Jesus was common, you know, in the good way. So so anyway, th there is a New Testament out there. It's a thick book. It's as as close to an accurate translation as I've ever found, and it's it's that's why it's this thick. Just the New Testament. It's he uh, he, he translates it in as close to uh, a parallel as you can get. And uh, uh, and anyway, that that a bunch of examples are in, of that are in this book. Let's grow up. Uh, this one's called The Treasure in Front of You. It's about kingdom principles, which are opposite of worldly principles. You know, the world says if you want to get rich, we'll gather a lot of money and hold on to it and put it in, a, in a, an IRA or a CD or a BVD or, a, you know, a, a something like that. Or No, not a BVD, but, but anyway, and, and, and then don't let anybody have any of it. And, and uh, if you live long enough, you might be rich enough to pay, have a fancy casket. And, and, uh, but the... the the kingdom principle, if you want to get rich, give it away. It's the opposite of the worldly principle. And you know that that's true. You know, if you've given yourself to your children, you know they're giving it back to you now. And uh, that's kingdom principles are impossible to understand looking at through our worldly eyes. And uh, part of the world church's problem is we've become worldly, and we are getting worldly results back. Uh, that's right. And so this, the treasure in front of you is happiness uh, found by living by kingdom principles. Um, finding real happiness th uh, through, through kingdom living no matter what, you, what you've done or what you're facing. That's the subtitle. And these are on, um, these are for kids. These are on chastity. And uh, this for girls and this for boys. And I, I wrote these some years ago, but they're still pretty applicable and uh, uh, it's just logical reasons why the Lord said to wait okay choices and consequences <laughs> every choice you make has a consequence every every choice you make has two sets of consequences now and later okay a immediate and eventual and I just and uh, if immediate is fun eventual is not going to be fun eventual is more important because it lasts longer <laughs> anyway I just try to talk uh, like like the, the talk that that folks gave me that made sense, and, uh, and those are, I'll take those. Uh, there are suggested prices on those white uh, posters behind it. Those are not arbitrary. Uh, those, are, those are not fixed. Uh, they're, in fact, uh, I give a lot of them away. So if you want one but you don't have any money, well, uh, steal it and ask forgiveness, okay? <laughs> Tonight only, that's, uh, and that's permissible, all right? You remember that. But not not next week. We'll okay. Uh, yes, right. Right. yes, right. Yes, right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so anyway. Okay. Let me see. Now I got to turn on my PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> that's 
right. <laughs> oh, they'll live a blameless life. <laughs> we steal fuller's books. <laughs> Sell them on eBay. <laughs> tell you, when, when the preacher puts my screen up, it's always a foot higher than when I put the screen up. I just don't know why. <laughs> um, you know, uh, back in, in Israel uh, 100 years ago, I mean, 2,000 years ago, uh, I was taught, okay? <laughs> I just want you to know that. <laughs> you were a, a, a Philistine. <laughs> 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 I just want you to remember that. Okay? Put it all in perspective. Have you? Oh, my. But you rose again. I rose again. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've got Cindy and Larry January here from Groover. I've already bragged on Groover <laughs> several times since I've been here. And uh, some of you are from Groover, too. I, I've learned. That's right. Uh, boy, I know. Everybody you know who's from Groover, I like. <laughs> Still, and I can't say that about anywhere else. <laughs> Except Guyman now. <laughs> but, but I've only been here two days. So. <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 Groover was my best church. Uh, when I was, I was campus minister at McMurray, and I, I really was under fire for two years from liberals. And uh, they tried to call me a holy roller and all this stuff. And, and uh, I, I just finally left. I got sick of it. And the bishop pointed me to Groover. And I thought, where <laughs> first? <laughs> and he said, way up there south of Wyoming, you know, a little bit. <laughs> we, we go to supper in liberal Kansas. <laughs> what? <laughs> and uh, I really felt like I'd been exiled. But, boy, I, I was wrong. <laughs> I hate to admit I'm wrong. Because evangelists are never wrong. But I was there have been several times since then, too. And, but um, Groover's just a, a unique place with sweet, wonderful people. And they're educated, and they're smart, and they're Christian. And, and uh, uh, we, the, I was there and for a while, and I was also an EMT. And so uh, J.C. Harris said, every preacher has to be either a fireman or an EMT. And I said, oh, really? So <laughs> he was lying. <laughs> he, was, he was just so full of it. I mean, J.C. was. But I became one anyway because <laughs> I thought y'all expected that. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't become a fireman because I didn't want to get dirty. Whoa, I'll tell you, did, was I? <laughs> was I? Did I? Was I in first shot? <laughs> anyway, some of you medical people. But um, I, I not only was a pastor, folks, but also uh, took them to the hospital and and uh, sometimes did CPR on them, and uh, you just get close to folks uh, when you're uh, up in, in that kind of thing. And, and the church burned down right after I got there, <laughs> which was which was really a distraction. And, um, uh, and uh, I thought, now what do I do? And uh, but you know what? We all got together, and God used our gifts. It's kind of like the loaves and the fishes. None of us knew what we were doing, but we Lord blessed it, and and we. Uh, it all worked, and uh, and I still don't know how it did. It was just a miracle, and uh, and we were having trouble with our offerings several times in the newsletter. I would before that I would have to say, now we're a little short on on our offerings and that. I thought they were poor. You know, JC said they was poor. All right, we lied again. <laughs> and and they built the church and paid for it in cash. <laughs> Wrote a check for this big gorgeous building. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> And I learned they just need to be inspired, you know, motivated. <laughs> but your daddy, Ollie Wallen, and, and Carly Knight and those guys, they, they cleaned that church off, the, the old ruined, burned church, and in a couple of days. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then we planned and built that beautiful, gorgeous church. And even though none of us knew what we were doing, the Lord knew what, what he was doing. And, and I really looked back and realized that, we gave our best efforts, and the Lord added his Holy Spirit, and it was a glorious thing. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I still get emotional over it. <laughs> it's just a building, but, it, but it's not. It's a lot, it's a lot more. All right. Uh, <clears throat> John Wesley, after his conversion, I've told you, y'all haven't been here. I've told you that John Wesley was born 
in a, a northern, northern part or central northern England uh, to a very irritating priest and his wife. <laughs> they had 19 children, and uh, uh, <laughs> I'd be irritating too if I had 19 children. And uh, he almost died in a fire when he was six years old. Uh, his, his parishioners or, or the church folks never quite figured out the perpetrator, but uh, set the parsonage on fire. Uh, but they got out, got him out. Uh, but they almost thought that John uh, wasn't going to get out. He was stuck upstairs, and the fire was uh, consuming the parsonage. And John, uh, Jack, his father tried to uh, rush in, but the stairway was engulfed in flames. So he came back out and prayed for the Lord to receive his son's soul. Uh, but the neighbors uh, climbed up on each other's shoulders and jerked John out of the second floor of the window, and the roof caved in right after it. And that was a sign to Samuel and Susanna that John was meant for something special. And he was. And he was a brand plucked from the burning, as she called him, and he later referred to himself. He went to Oxford University, studied, got very religious, did all the academic stuff, still felt unfulfilled, went to America, to Georgia, to Savannah, stayed there two years as a missionary, failed at everything he did, <laughs> especially women. <laughs> he, he, uh, he preached over their heads, and, uh, and then he fell in love with one of his youth, which was an uh, uh, unfortunate thing, and, and uh, he uh, told her they weren't going to get married, so she married somebody else, and, and he, he forbade her communion, and, and she had him arrested and thrown in jail. I mean, this, uh, if you've been to Savannah, you know there's a, a park with a big statue of John Wesley. He would never have, be, have believed that would have happened in a million years because he left a fugitive uh, in the night, <laughs> a, 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 an accused criminal. Uh, and uh, but it is amazing. I mean, what what is it that you've done that you messed up at? Okay. Uh, well, don't I don't want to know. But but, but no. I used to want to know, but not anymore. <laughs> Just think about it. And what is it that that the evil one has said? You'll never get over this. You know, who are you ever to set foot in church again because of? You know, we all got something. All right. And uh, and and boy, John Wesley had more more to feel that way about than anybody and because uh, he was very religious he had the high standards he was obsessive compulsive and uh, works righteousness and yet he failed and was a criminal and all this stuff and then he got back to England the word got around and uh, the, and uh, but sometimes you got to be at your lowest point before you can look up right <laughs> when you dig a hole and you find yourself deep down there first thing you do stop digging right <laughs> and John did and he looked up, and uh, uh, I have found God doesn't will everything, but he, God doesn't waste anything. You remember that? He doesn't will everything, but he doesn't waste anything. And he takes our biggest mess-ups, and he uses them for glorious purposes. That maybe would never have happened had we been little goody two-shoes and all that stuff. And, and, uh, but he wants us to figure out what that is. What is. How is it he wants us to spend the rest of our life? Uh, because we messed up. Uh, and um, that's just a glorious way to, to live uh, when to understand that the Lord remembers our sins no more I mean I heard that and I thought well God's smarter than I am and I remember my sins I really remember your sins <laughs> and, uh, uh, but God's so smart he can do that right <laughs> and I say oh, Lord forgive you my sins what are you talking about Tom <laughs> I don't remember anything God can do this call, I call him God right <laughs> but anyway so that's the that's lead up into this and he was at his lowest point when he was wandering on Aldersgate Street, and he walked in reluctantly against his will, walked into a Bible study where, uh, where a man was reading a, something from Martin Luther, and John Wesley was converted. He felt his heart strangely warmed, and he trusted Christ. And this was after all the mess. And uh, he met some Arabians who were very simple, met him uh, over in America. Simple, kind of hallelujah, praise the Lord type folks who who really seemed shallow to him, but they had something that he didn't have, and that was a simple faith and a relationship with Jesus Christ and they had an assurance of salvation. Uh, and uh, he met him on the ship and then got to know him more in America. And then when he finally got run off and came back to England, he, he went to Germany, and he seriously studied the Moravians. He considered becoming a Moravian, uh, and uh, he went to a, a place uh, called... a. Heronut, which is uh, 
a community was a community of Mer Moravians. These were folks from uh, Czechoslovakia area now who had been run off, uh, persecuted, and uh, by, uh, by Catholics and others, and uh, had landed in Germany and formed this, this little community. And uh, John uh, uh, went down because he wanted to seriously consider becoming one of them. Uh, however, he, uh, um, I'm completely away from my notes. Oh, I wanted to show you something. <laughs> I appreciate, uh, let me interrupt here for a minute. I hope I'm not like Joe Biden. I start three or four sentences at once and never finish any of them, you know. <laughs> if I start doing that, just take me by the hand and lead me off and put me in a little room and lock it, okay? <laughs> I just have a slide here I wanted to show you. I appreciate your, your support, your financial support. I really do because uh, my ministry is totally run by uh, contributions, and I appreciate it. Uh, here, I used to call my ministry the John Wesley Adventure, and uh, uh, and here was a ch I said, make your checks out to the John Wesley Adventure, and here's a check that I got. Uh, hang on a minute, where is it? Go. <laughs> the John Wesley Avenger. <laughs> That's right. And I thought, well, that's, that's silly. And then I thought, no, I kind of like that, you know. <laughs> Throwing terror in the hearts of liberals everywhere. <laughs> he strikes when they least expect it. <laughs> that's right. That's why I wear a black shirt now. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I want you to see that. <laughs> and, the, and the bank uh, deposited it, too. They didn't even, they just rolled their eyes. Uh, but anyway, he went to... Um, I need to focus and keep up. There's uh, Peter Berger, who was the Moravian who meant so much to him. Uh, uh, the, and um, right after he was converted, John Wesley had doubts. And uh, he thought, well, I just feel like I'm saved. You ever been that way? Doubted your salvation? Well, so did John Wesley. And, uh, and so he said to Mr. Berger, he said, you know, as long as I'm doubting my salvation, I shouldn't teach or preach, should I? And he said, oh, no, don't stop. He said, he said, keep preaching faith. Uh, and uh, if you just keep preaching it anyway, you'll get it back. And because you get it back, well, you'll have it, <laughs> he said. And Wesley said, what? <laughs> he said, and he said, well, okay. So he started preaching. And he found he did get his, salvation, his, his confidence in his salvation back. It's, and he said, I don't know how that works, but it does. <laughs> And uh, Berger told him a lot of simple things like that, that, that Wesley, the intellectual, well, well, you know, some people can get so educated they return to stupid. Did you know that? <laughs> John Wayne said, life is hard. It's harder if you're stupid, right? <laughs> and uh, some people can get, get so educated that they get not only dumb, but stuck on dumb, way up here, all right, that they cannot understand the very basics of life and of faith, too. Uh, I don't want to, if I get that away, slap me. All right. So, uh, so anyway, Ber I'm, okay, focus. He went back to Germany, to Herrenhut, and he dwelt among the Germans for several months. And he, he said he felt like he was in heaven already. But, he said, they waste time. <laughs> he said, their worship services, they just sit there for hours, and they just go to dwell, and they, they don't accomplish anything, you know. <laughs> he was, you know, he was obsessive compulsive. He, he, uh, he had an, uh, every minute of every day scheduled for something. And that's why he was called a Methodist. He had a method for everything. He meant kind of messed up up here. Uh, but uh, that's also why he changed the world. Um, and, uh, and so he just, you know, OCs are hard to live with. And, and, uh, and so he, he, would, he would say, okay, come on and we Let's study the Bible or, or study the languages or study the classics or, or something. Let's, or go feed the poor. You know, they would just kind of sit. They would pray. Here, wait for the Lord to move somebody, and then and then he called me. Wesley, he was just, he stood up and finally complained about it, and uh, he got up and he was gonna he stormed out, and he, he said that he said someone as I was leaving uh, after I'd made a speech, someone hid my hat, <laughs> and I had to come back and find it. And somebody was irritated at Mr. Wesley too, <laughs> hoping he would leave, and so so he was gonna make us. Uh, dramatic exit and leave. So anyway, he went back to England from Germany and uh, didn't know what to do. Here he was ordained. He was gra a graduate and he uh, 
just like our appointment system. They had appointments, and the bishop sent uh, graduates to, uh, to appoint them to churches, and he didn't have one yet. So he didn't quite know what to do. He was still disgraced, if only in his mind, but uh, others sort of were looking at him circumspect. And uh, while he had been in America failing as a missionary, his friend, George Whitfield, had stayed back in England and had become a successful evangelist. Uh, and, and a rather phenomenal, I'm a, uh, out of the ordinary one, the, uh, he was preaching outdoor uh, spontaneous revivals. He would just step up on a tree stump or something, start singing a hymn and clapping his hands, and, and he would gather a crowd. He had a deep or oratorical voice like this. You know, brother, if you and I had a voice like this, we could be famous, couldn't we? Because it doesn't matter what you say, it's how you say it. You know, if you sound like the Lord... That's why, I have a, that's why I have a reverb on, on my PA. So if I have a weak point, I'll turn up the reverb, and it seems like the truth. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Wes, and, uh, he was also cockeyed. <laughs> that's, that's not an artist's mistake. He, uh, yeah, yeah he, had a, a, he had a wandering eye. <laughs> and so all of his portraits are, are not flattering. And uh, so Whitfield was, um, he was a member of the Holy Club. And, uh, and he was very dramatic in his presentation. And he uh, would, would preach inside, he was preaching inside an Anglican church, but the crowd was so large, the windows were open and people outside were trying to hear, hear it. And so spontaneously stepped outside, stepped up on this tree stump and started preaching to like 3,000 people. And uh, this was highly, uh, not only irregular, but illegal because the Anglicans believed it was, it was in their their code that, that it wasn't a sermon unless it was in in a building blessed by a bishop, consecrated by a bishop. Okay, we all know where that is in scripture, don't we? And they had all all these kooky uh, beliefs and uh, and requirements. So it was it was and the Anglican Church was a, a branch of the government over and I think still is over there. It's funded by taxes. They don't have even have offerings. So uh, if you broke Anglican law, you broke civil law. Uh, and uh, and so, but but he didn't care. You know, when you're Billy Graham, you're bulletproof, and he had all these followers and worshipers and admirers. And uh, so, uh, so uh, he would preach and had these dramatic. Uh, it, it was set in dramatic uh, um, uh, monologues, and it was said that Whitfield could say Mesopotamia, and people would weep. <laughs> See, I didn't. You didn't weep. You laughed when I said it. I had. I just don't have it, and so uh, um, and, uh, and anyway, he had a following. But Whitfield wanted to go to America and form a, an, uh, a uh, orphanage, and and he eventually would. And Wesley said, uh, mm, "No, you don't. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I thought I was thinking the same thing two years ago. Uh, it's not what you think, but you can't tell evangelists anything, can you?" <laughs> and uh, so he was going to go, and he said. Wesley, Mr. Wesley, uh, look at what, I'm, what I've accomplished here. It's just now starting. I uh, hate to leave it, but God's calling me. Why don't you take over what I'm doing? And Wesley said, oh, no, of course not. I can't. I mean, absolutely not. It's out of the question. And he came up with about a dozen reasons why. You know, it was illegal, for one thing. And uh, Wesley was a little scholar. He didn't have his, his uh, panache or his pizzazz or his voice or any of those things. It was just, it was just not proper, he said. Uh, and that's so important uh, to, or it was to them. And, and Whitfield said, then listen, before you decide, just do this. Tomorrow I'm going to preach outside Bristol, which is a town a hundred or so miles west of London. And he said, I just want you to stand where I stand, see what I see and hear what I hear, okay? Wesley thought, well, there's no sin in that. So he said, reluctantly, I stood up next to Mr. Whitfield in the morning. And we were by the road where the colliers, the coal miners, were walking to work. And he stood up and he uh, began singing a psalm. And when he gathered a sufficient crowd, he began preaching. Behold the, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And as he preached, Wesley said, he, he saw these upturned faces, thousands of them now, blackened by coal dust. Uh, he said this in the evening when they were coming back. So they had already been to the, the mines. 
uh, and little rivulets of tears uh, cutting through the coal dust and the sun glinting off of it. He said, I scarcely could believe my eyes. I'd never beheld this uh, in church, much less outdoors. And uh, when it was finished, Wesley was just, did not know what to do. Uh, he was at an impasse because he did not want to do it. It was improper, it was illegal, but it worked. You know? And he was kind of like approaching the, the Moravians. They're little, they're uneducated, they're simple, but they've got something I haven't got. And, he, and when he comes to these impasses, he struggles and he prays and he wrestles until he comes up with an answer. And he does what he always does when he uh, has this. He, he gets a Bible and he opens up it and he puts his finger down several times. We all know how, uh, how God uses that. And every time it's go up on the mount and die. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a positive but you'll be sorry <laughs> scripture three or four different times. <laughs> And don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> and so he says, Lord, you're not making it any easier on me here. <laughs> and he finally closes the book and he concedes that it's probably going to be suicide, but he's going to try. And have you ever, has the Lord ever led you to do something or you felt inclined and yet something in you says, no, that's not me. For some, that's just coming to evening worship, okay? <laughs> Absolutely not. That's just not for me. It's like eating supper on Thanksgiving. I'm just, I'm, or I'm still full from lunch, from noon. And, uh, and so, but, and that's how he was. He was just, he could not conceive of himself doing this and came up with all kinds of excuses why he shouldn't do it, shouldn't do it. But, you know, this is one of the difference in, a Christian and an effective Christian is he uh, he said he overcame that that invisible barrier between him and that and and he said I'm gonna try it and he did and he got up he said his language is so negative in his journal I got up uh, the next morning I crept up onto the hill there in the commons and I spoke to the rabble <laughs> in the vulgar he said language and uh, uh, expecting no, expecting them to you know just no, not pay him any mind, and he got the same response that Whitfield got first time in his life. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know what it's like to give an invitation and nobody comes. You know, when preachers give an invitation, they have two fears: what do I do if nobody comes? Second is, what do I do if somebody comes? <laughs> <laughs> and and Wesley sort of had that fear too, and, and uh, he thought for sure nobody would come, but hundreds came, <laughs> and and uh, and he he preached in his normal voice. He he wasn't dramatic. He wasn't didn't ex dis distort anything of the scriptures, and he found they were receptive. And here he was finally at home spiritually. This is his purpose to uh, uh, in that God has been preparing him for. And uh, for 50, I think, three years after that, he would do that same thing. He would, he determined, he would travel. He would, uh, and, and a day in, in John Wesley's life, I forget all about my, um, my uh, PowerPoint slides here. A day in his life would be like this. He would get up at 4 a.m. every morning, pray for an hour till 5, and then he would travel to some spot where people were walking to work. And he would uh, position himself where they could hear him and start preaching or singing or, or uh, reading scriptures and, or telling a story. And they would gather and he would preach about the gospel and he'd offer them Christ. He would offer an invitation uh, for them to accept Jesus Christ. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. It was sort of uh, dependent on who, the, uh, who the, the biggest one, tallest guy in the crowd was going to do everybody else did and oftentimes that was a bully or a drunk or you know a thug or something like that and sometimes they would weep and they would respond and sometimes they would attack him <laughs> and, uh, and he never knew <laughs> which it would be and you hate it when that happens <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and then he would go from that time they would go to work and he would travel somewhere else and he would preach to somebody on a group on their lunch hour who go somewhere else, preach to them when they're coming home from the coal mines, and then sometime he would go to an inn or a camp and he would preach a fourth time 
in the evening to whoever was gathered there. He would preach three or four times uh, uh, for uh, 365 days of the year uh, for 53 years, I think. Uh, he uh, and, uh, uh, and he traveled all over uh, King, uh, England, Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, and went uh, dozens and dozens of times uh, around uh, the country. Uh, what was it you said that was too hard for you to do? You know, <laughs> that was just not not your thing to do. I, I, I asked folk, used to ask folks when I was a pastor to do things. They say, "Oh no, uh, I've I've already done my part. I'm a, let the young folks do that." I said, "Well, is that right?" Well, what, exactly what have you done, <laughs> you know? And, uh, <laughs> well, I sat there for 48 years, you know, <laughs> and I wrote it and put my dollar in the po in the pocket, and then I start telling them what John Wesley did. I said, you know, he really is my example, and I feel guilty about everything anyway. That's why I'm going to live forever. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I, what, no matter what I do, I, I re go back to John Wesley, and I think, I could do so much more. Uh, I am wasting God's time here. I don't know if that's conviction or being o OC or, or what, but I like to think that we all need to be driven a little bit by some template, by some example, some uh, a person who has, has done far more than we have. And, uh, and then if we do one-tenth of what that person does, it's a whole lot more than we would have done if we just used ourselves as our standards. Uh, John uh, preached, he said that, greatest number of people he ever preached to in one gathering was at Gwinnock Pit which is down south in England in Cornwall and um, it's a big natural sinkhole it's still there today. He said I preached to 32,000 people that sounds like a ministerial estimate doesn't it? <laughs> How many were in church this morning? Oh 32,000 <laughs> something like that. Well that'll look good you know, in, my, in my charge conference report <laughs> that'll factor in really good isn't it? Uh, he would he would preach anywhere. He, he learned that um, uh, you don't have to you know, have to be in a pulpit to be a sermon. Uh, he he would preach on a city square or on steps. He would preach on uh, there was a city cross usually in the middle of every uh, every town, and he would preach. And sometimes they would listen. Some he said some of them sometimes they would just stand back and look like this. You ever had that look? Probably when you first spoke, uh, you got up your first Sunday and. You, 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 <laughs> <laughs> he, and they said, he talks funny. He's not from around here, you know. <laughs> I, said, I don't know how to accept him. I don't just know how to take him. You know, you know how it is. But you're a good guy. And that came across pretty soon. And Well, he said, he said oftentimes they would get there. And women would take their children. And they, would, they would shield them from him like he was you know, on some registry or something like, like that. <laughs> um, and uh, here he is. I don't know where this is. He's preaching on a chair on a table uh, through a hole in a floor. <laughs> and the men are on the second floor and the women are on the first floor. <coughs> but that's John Wesley preaching. Uh, and uh, it, the, uh, a wonderful uh, story. As the common, ordinary people, look, Wesley learned that the farther away he got from church, the more receptive people were to the gospel. I don't know what that says, but he found it to be true. I have a feeling it's still that is that still true, uh, and uh, that's why you ought to have some kind of ministry way over here or way over there, away from this big pretty building that you have, because there are a lot of people who will go anywhere but in the big pretty building, and you just surprise them other places too, onto their their turf and in, uh, on their uh, uh, familiar ground. Uh, as as the lay people loved him as the rabble loved him, the drunks uh, uh, and all, the, the clergy began to hate him and uh, they um, uh, uh, they they began to call him a fanatic and you know a, a, a crazy man, a, a nonconformist and, and much worse and uh, articles would appear in the news uh, by clergy on uh, how are we going to stomp out this Methodist movement, these fanatics uh, and there was an or a a strong organized movement among Anglican clergy to wipe out Mr. Wesley. And uh, they began punishing Methodist people who would come to his meetings. And they would uh, station clergy and alcoholics and police around the edges and have them arrested just for attending Methodist meetings. Uh, and uh, we have no idea how terrible it got back then. 
uh, they would be arrested. They would uh, mobs would attack women. They would especially focus on uh, pregnant women, and they would beat them until they miscarried. Uh, they would uh, haul uh, businessmen and farmers in before judges, throw them in jail, and the judge would sue them and fine them everything they had uh, and uh, leave them in ruin. Some were uh, younger men were uh, punished by uh, being conscripted into the military. That was their punishment for going to the Methodist meetings, and they uh, were sent off uh, in other, you know, England was had these wars of attrition. They were they were taking over countries, and the, their goal was to you know own the whole world and control rule the whole world. And so they need, had this constant hunger for soldiers, and and that was a, a typical that was a common punishment for going to Methodist meetings was you get drafted, and many never came back uh, from the from the battlefields. Um, uh, they would. Uh, Mobs would go into the night, into the night, and they would break into people who repeatedly went to Methodist meetings, and they would tear up things. They would say they would tear up everything that could be torn up. They would burn houses down. They would literally tear little frail houses down of the poor because they uh, never, because they had. Well, Wesley, I mean, Wesley uh, was was uh, violated, and he was crucified in the press in the church, in pulpits all across the kingdom. And Charles, his brother, also traveled with him and preached. And uh, we know Charles was the, the musician and the poet, but he was also a brave preacher. And uh, he, Charles just couldn't believe how, how everywhere he looked and turned, people were vilifying John Wesley. And he said, brother, why don't you answer to some of these charges? And he said, when I gave my life to the Lord and I sacrificed it, I didn't, I didn't leave out my reputation, so I'm going to sacrifice that too. <laughs> and John Wesley learned something. I mean, you could not defeat this guy. He, uh, I mean, I get wounded when somebody, uh, you know, uh, look, does like this when I'm preaching or yawns, you know, a big <laughs> yawn. It hurts my feelings. And, uh, well, uh, John Wesley would, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he learned what Hollywood knows. They, Hollywood says there's no such thing as negative publicity. <laughs> and I don't agree, but, but <laughs> I've had a little bit of it. But, but anyway, he, he learned that uh, when people were criticizing him, uh, after a while they'd forget what they were mad about, and then they would keep talking about him. <laughs> so, so he learned that he, he became famous <laughs> because of the criticism that, that was le leveled at him. So, I mean, because he had this kingdom attitude. He saw criticism through his kingdom eyes. He didn't like it, uh, but he learned that it wasn't. So, most of us might will fold our tents and leave, and you know, God will never hear from us again, right? We'll get our feelings hurt, and we'll go home and, and uh, stay bitter. <laughs> Not Wesley. He fed on that stuff. <laughs> I mean, he got better and better, and his influence uh, expanded and expanded because of the slander. And, and eventually... You know, if, if it's just slander people are saying about you, or if it's distortion and unfair, eventually the truth is going to come out, isn't it? And um, if you get too defensive and you try to explain yourself, uh, well, you're going to look weak, and people are going to say, well, maybe there is something to it. Look how defensive she is, you know. No, you just keep on doing the right thing, uh, and, uh, and you don't let it get you down. And um, after a while, uh, people say, there must not have been anything to it. In fact, I think the problem's in the critic, not in the one that they're throwing stones at. And um, it's uh, quite a story. Uh, sometime uh, there were planned, uh, uh, there were plans that, that the clergy would make. They would uh, pay. They would pay the drunks to uh, bust up Methodist meetings, uh, to run cattle through and horses through the Methodist meetings while John was preaching. Uh, they would uh, run him off and stone him. Th there was one place where he was in Winsbury, which was the worst place he went. It was like eight months, continuous persecution every night. And he, he said he stood up to preach, and the stones were thick, and they were throwing them. And, uh, and he said, but not one struck me. I, pre I finished the sermon, and not one struck me. This was rare. <laughs> You know how it is, and and, uh, and and he said, he said angels protected me. Well, Charles was there, and he said, 
it wasn't angels. It was his lowness of stature. <laughs> he, was, he was short, you know. And I have learned that uh, that is, can be an advantage. You, you don't know about that, brother. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sometimes the, uh, sometime the, the beasts uh, will take a swing at you. If you're, <laughs> if you're not as tall as they are, they'll miss altogether. Uh, once he said, uh, oh, he, and he would write funny stories about his persecution. He wrote once, the beasts were tolerably quiet until I had nearly finished my sermon. Then they lifted up their voices, especially one who had filled his pockets with rotten eggs. But a, but a young man came up behind him, put his hand on each side, and mashed them all at once. <laughs> In an instant, he was perfumed all over, though it was not so sweet as balsam. <laughs> he came up behind him and went, you know, like that. Ew. <laughs> that was a pretty good story. Um, you know, we, you know, at annual conference, we sing, And Are We Yet Alive? That's the first hymn. Charles and John, that was one Charles wrote, but uh, he had them sing that because so many died during the year. They were killed. They were murdered. They died of frostbite. <laughs> They died of disease, uh, and uh, they died on the battlefield. And so when they really would not know uh, how many were still alive until annual conference, and they would call the roll. Sometimes they go six or eight names with no one responding, and uh, then they would sing that hymn. So it was quite a moving thing. Uh, okay, there's wind street. Let me, uh, another, okay, what, I've got to wrap this up. Uh, another place, uh, he was in uh, Newcastle, which is a seacoast town, and uh and uh, they were attacking him, and uh, these and, and these sailors and and, and others were, and uh, and and he had an unlikely protector, a burly fishwife, uh, stepped up onto the the porch where he was where he was uh, preaching, and she took him around the neck like this, Wesley, and she said, "All of ye, you be quiet right now. You shut up, uh, and you be nice to my canny man, or I'll give you this." And, and and he said they all suddenly suddenly got nice and behavior like little bad little schoolboys, you know, <laughs> because they knew her and they knew she meant it. <laughs> Sometime he would he would get, stand up and he would look and, and if they were he could tell that they were uh, stirring. He would look and he would he would spot the the head of the mob and he would say excuse me and he would walk through the. Uh, crowd and he would go right up to him and he would make friends with the mob with the mob leader and he was usually drunk you know but he said what's your name said, my name is Wesley and I'm glad you've come to hear me tonight I've got a special message for you and uh, you have a wife you have kids and the guy was you know, all of a sudden he was flattered that <laughs> that the preacher was paying attention to him and and he hmm, well and he said oftentimes uh, I turned my my foe into my protector in moments <laughs> and the guy would say this is my this is my friend down here and all of you and well, what's a mob to do when that happens? Um, let's see. Uh, let me go. Um, okay, just a couple more vignettes. Uh, he did. He fell in love several times. John Wesley's worst problem came with women. Ah, I tell you, can't live with them. Can't live without them. And um, this was a uh, Grace Murray, and she was a. Uh, he was a Scottish lass that he met in Newcastle up in northern England near Scotland and, and she attended one of his meetings and she uh, uh, she was just radiant you know? and unlike Sophie she had a few years on her and she studied with Mr. Wesley and he began taking her on his journeys and, and he said she was an angelic she was radiant she was lovely she was she was flawless she was and he had all these adjectives <laughs> that he always described all of his girlfriends with <laughs> the same one <laughs> I mean <laughs> what girl can resist that and um, so he he uh, he said uh, miss miss grace he said once he said he said I, I believe if I were ever to uh, assume matrimony ye would be the person <laughs> And uh, she said, oh, Mr. Wesley, oh, I am so honored. I believe if ye ever did, I would probably say yes. <laughs> and, well, was that a, a, a proposal? Uh, he, he decided it was. <laughs> and uh, so 
uh, he's, uh, so he, and Mr. And, and he took her off on a two week uh, traveling tour. The first stop, he stopped and he left her with a Mr. Uh, Williamson at, um, at a preaching point. And he was gonna go over here and preach. And he had her in safekeeping. So he went over here and when he arrived here, he got a, a letter from uh, Grace and Mr. Williamson asking Mr. Wesley's permission for them to get married. <laughs> hate that too uh it just throws a kink into your plans and uh so for about a year she was tied between mr williamson and mr wesley i mean t uh, torn between the two and uh finally charles uh said uh, uh i'm gonna solve this and so he, behind mr wesley's back his brother's back he he crept over and, and met grace and mr williamson and tied the knot right there on the spot and uh john never got over it <laughs> it was a uh, he considered it a betrayal and um, there was a big scene between them when they finally got back together and it was cold and these preachers were standing there like this and, and, uh, and, but finally they talked it out and they hugged each other and wept but Wesley was never had the relationship with Charles again Charles by the way got fed up with all the stones and the persecution after a few years and he became a normal preacher like that uh, Okay, speaking of women, he did get married, and it was the worst mistake he ever made. Uh, he, he, uh, 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 this is Molly Vaziel. She was a rich widow, and uh, she took care of him. They didn't have hospitals, and so Wesley would get injured a lot, and so he would have to be, recoup in someone's home, and he did in Ms. Vaziel's home, and he fell in love with her because she was tender and loving and angelic and all this, you know, and... Uh, um, and so they got married uh, eight days after they met. And um, they had an agreement. She wouldn't interfere with his ministry. He wouldn't ask her for money. So it, what could go wrong? And uh, so he began preaching. And, and Wesley had female helpers, you know. And uh, he, he really didn't care what gender you were as long as he said you were preaching the truth, the gospel, and you were bearing fruit. That is, you were bringing people to Christ. And uh, uh, that's... Uh, there's, we've always had, had women preachers, and we uh, have not, uh, you know, we, we haven't given a whole lot of, that's not the 11th commandment, uh, that women uh, don't have no authority over men. Look, the Bible says women keep silent in church. If you want to really get technical, okay, I mean, do you really want to press that? <laughs> uh, anybody um, believe that, or have you been obedient to that? Of course not. And anyway, anyway, Paul, I mean, Wesley decided, although God made Adam and Eve and he gave us roles and all that, and man is the spiritual head of the house, uh, you know, if, if, if daddy's active in church, probably the kids are going to be active in church. If daddy's not active, but mama is, probably the kids aren't going to be active in church. There's something to that, right? Uh, but let's not, you know, carry it beyond which God is headed. And so Wesley said, if a, if a woman feels like she is led uh, to bring people to Christ, or she understands the scripture and she wants to expound upon that. He said, I'll test her, I'll listen to her, I'll see uh, if she's got content, and if she speaks with conviction, and I'll mainly see if she bears fruit, if people come to Christ. And, and then if all that, the checklist is off, uh, I'll give her some responsibility. And we've been doing it ever since. Uh, problem is not your gender the problem is your theology because uh, today we have many women who are leaders but are not bearing fruit uh, in fact they preach a different gospel a, a foreign gospel the gospel of liberalism and uh, uh, that's the problem and and of course they when we complain they say you just don't like women uh, no it's not that <laughs> it's it's what those women are preaching and teaching um, uh, okay uh, so anyway, uh, Molly would hide, would cloak herself, and she would uh, go to Mr. Wesley's meetings to see if he had any hanky-panky going on with these female helpers. <laughs> she really thought that this, she didn't like it at all. Uh, he would write letters, and he would sign them, affectionately yours, and oh, she didn't like that. Which Greek word, affectionately, are you talking about? And, uh, <laughs> and so, and uh, she, uh, uh, one, uh, she, one time one of his preachers uh, went up to their home and the door was a little bit open. He opened it and Wesley was on the floor. Molly was like this and she had his hair in her hand and he was like this on the ground. And he said, 
I, excuse me, I see I've interrupted something. <laughs> anyway, it's a true story. That's right. So she beat him up. <laughs> he didn't have to take this from from her too. Anyway, they got they separated after I think eight years. Uh, oh, they were they were separated the whole time, really. And she finally died. He wrote. Oh, she left him, and uh, he wrote in his journal. Today, my wife left me. I neither asked her to leave, nor shall I ask her to return. <laughs> Very kept his English chin up, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, oh, I just don't have time for any more. Uh, I'll, I'll stop this one. Um, trouble with this is there's no off button when, when you're, <laughs> when you're, the story is so interesting. And, uh, anyway, uh, that's what Methodism has been most of our history. It has been a long line of preachers and lay people. Uh, it, it started out all lay people uh, because the preachers weren't fit. You know, they were proud and arrogant and political, uh, just like a lot of them are today. And uh, God didn't use them. And so uh, Wesley found out that um, uh, the more trouble that they'd been in, you know, the Many Methodist preachers were alcoholics and sobered up wife beaters. And uh, uh, he said the more they appreciated forgiveness and, and uh, loved uh, the, the feeling of being given a second chance. He said they made the best preachers of all. Uh, and uh, So Methodism was, was, a, was uh, a movement to bring normal, ordinary people on the street to Jesus Christ by normal and ordinary people who had, been, who had come to Jesus. Only in recent history have we become this this uh, institution with professional clergy who who uh, believe this cockeyed stuff uh, that has almost nothing to do with original Christianity, uh, who vie for po political position and all this. And, uh, uh, that's what the Anglicans were in, in his day. We so we have come full circle. We we now are uh, the antithesis of what Methodism was because. He looked at Anglicanism. He loved the church, but he admitted that it was failing in the Great Commission. It, it was not bringing people to Jesus Christ. And so he said, well, if they're not going to do it, uh, somebody will. The stones will shout. And so he, he got the stones converted, and he got them shouting. And uh, now we, the United Methodist Church, are just like the Anglicans uh, in, in so many ways. And that's why I say a new movement of, from lay people needs to rise up. A new movement will rise up. I just want to be among them, don't you? Uh, I, I want to be a part of it. Why should they have all the fun? Uh, there's no life better in the whole world than a life where by your fruits people are coming to know Jesus Christ and getting off the, the bottle and, and uh, their lives are changing and they collapse in tears and, and they're uh, com completely different. I, I remember... A guy in Groover who, a, a policeman, I won't name him, but foulest mouth guy I've ever met. <laughs> uh, no, no names. <laughs> but uh, nasty. I, I used to ride with him. I was an EMT, and he was a policeman, and I would ride with him, and, and uh, we would do runs together. Nastiest guy I think I've ever met. Bitter, bitter, bitter guy. And and I, I, I didn't really like being with him. I used to avoid him at all. Just got him dirty after I was with him, but but God said somehow be his friend, and so I would be his friend, and he would tell me his bitterness and all this stuff, and he would he would cuss, and then he would cast a glance over at me just to see my reaction. I think he expected me to go oh like that or something like that, <laughs> and uh, uh and I didn't, and I, I just mm -hmm. in my heart I did, but. Uh, but uh, I just tried to be his friend and, and, and assume that, that, that if he really was, this he really was expressing himself, he'd be kind of testing me, testing Christianity by testing me. And, uh, and but I, I would have, I thought the Calvinists were right. Some people are destined for hell, you know, and there's nothing you can do about it. This guy comes to mind when, when they may have a point. But, uh, but, but, um, uh, uh, who was it? Larry Jones. Baptist evangelist came through town, and this policeman, 
I didn't know it, but he attended a, a crusade. He came to Jesus. He did. And, and he showed up at, at my parsonage door, and he said, I need Jesus. And I said, what? <laughs> you been drinking again? <laughs> I didn't say that, but I thought that. I, I mean, I was stunned when he said that. I didn't believe him. I mean, I knew he needed Jesus. But, uh, but I mean, I thought, what's your game? He said, he said, I know what you've been trying to do, <laughs> what you've been trying to tell me. And um, uh, he said, he said, this just hadn't, uh, hadn't all come together until I listened to Larry Jones preach. And, and it seemed like when he's preaching, he's looking straight at me. And he gave me an invitation, and I just knew I needed Jesus. And I do. He said, I ask you to forgive me. And I, <laughs> I nearly fainted right there. And, and he said, he said, I want to be baptized. I want to join the church. I said, I was going to say, yes. Uh, because, you know, many times we try to evangelize our friends, and but we see no sign that it's working. And uh, we just hope that something we said will stay, will stick. And, and uh, well, that's how I felt with, with him. And uh, But we went to, he said, I, he said, I don't have a suit. I never have. A, I, I, if I'm going to join church, I want to wear a suit. He said, would you go with me to Spearman and, Pick out a suit. I said, "Yes." <laughs> and I was now getting ecstatic. Now we Spearman bought him a suit, and came back that Sunday. Uh, I baptized him, and, and his he and his radiant wife and little baby were there. And uh, uh, I'll never, if if ever I doubt the power of God to rescue the perishing, uh, I, th I remember that policeman. And uh, uh, oh. Today, he's a Methodist preacher. Did I tell you that? <laughs> he is. He's in Amarillo, Texas. He's a Methodist preacher. Boy, I never would have would have predicted, predicted that. <laughs> and he is one courageous evangelist himself. Um, and, you, you know, uh, I never explained the plan of salvation to him or anything like that. I was just his friend. And um, uh, he knew what I believed. And, and, uh, and somehow God used several of us. Uh, and, and timing, he timed it all together. And long after I'd written him off, Jesus said, now. He kind of like the angel with Jacob who wrestled all night, and then finally he said, I gotta go. And he said, okay, boing. And, <laughs> and Jacob was defeated, you know. I mean, I mean the angel could have could have won it, could have done that at any point in the in the battle. But he waited for for Jacob to be exhausted or whatever it was he had to work out. So, so anyway, uh, I just want to say Methodism is about evangelism. It's about changing lives and lifting them up out of the darkness of the world and of the mistakes and the errors they've made, the people they've harmed, uh, the uh, uh, you know the debauchery that they have caused, and uh, it's lifting them up out of all that, and giving them a second chance, and letting them know uh, God's not done with you. He hadn't even started, but all well, you got to surrender. You got to surrender, and. and uh, the liberals don't believe any of that stuff, okay? They believe evangelism is, is a, a fool's idea. Uh, so that's why we're in such trouble, in, in such peril in the United Methodist Church. Um, and that's why I, I need you to consider seriously, what is my part in this? So I've been singing Onward Christian Soldiers for a long time. Now I'm going to ask you to sign up and be a soldier be one. Let's do more than sing. Let's consider what, who our audience, who, who our sphere of influence, who the people are within our circle of influence, whom we can influence. Uh, and uh, let's, we'll feel reluctant like John Wesley did at, at Bristol. Uh, we'll, we'll feel that invisible wall go up. Oh, I just can't do that. I just can't do that. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, and the Lord's going to make you miserable until you do. Okay. So we might as well surrender so we'll win. That's a kingdom principle. The, the world wins by, you know, conquering and defeating. In the kingdom, you win by surrendering. You win by giving up. <laughs> and uh, so surrender whatever those voices are that tell you you can't do it. Not you. You're not smart enough. You don't know the Bible. You're too old. You're too young. You're too something. Uh, not ordained. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
know, ordination just about neutralizes you know, <laughs> for, for that stuff. <laughs> you have not been ruined by seminary. <laughs> There's still hope for you. Uh, so anyway, if I was, uh, you know, uh, I wish I would leave so I could quit talking. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you, brother. I, he, he laughs at my corny joke. <laughs> I want you to come with me. <laughs> kind of like a laugh track over here. <laughs> Encourage others. Um, what do you think? Okay, I'm done. Unless you ask me a provocative question. <laughs> okay, what do you think about all this? What's going through your mind and your heart before we leave here? Nothing. All right, okay. <laughs> Let's go. What? What's stirring in your heart and your soul? Well, what I think was Kind of like hu- a human, wasn't he? never too late. No. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't know, uh, it, it, it was a Calvinist. And Calvinists believe, followers of John Calvin, that people are utterly foul. There's no spark of the divine. And, and uh, that, uh, that people are already either saved or, or lost. They're either going to heaven or hell. That's been established from the foundations of the world. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay, they of course are saved, of course, and, uh, but but we're not sure about you, but uh, me, but uh, and uh, Wesley uh, and I think that's ridiculous. Uh, that that um, what then what? Why did Jesus say what he did in Matthew 28? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. It is not God's will that any of these should perish. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never had an explanation given to me. I mean, am I wasting my time up here trying to persuade people? To, did I with the policeman? Uh, and um, and they, that's when Calvinists lapse into ecclesial babble. <laughs> they they have lots of words, but uh, they don't make sense. And <coughs> and Wesley said, "No, it is not true." And he said, "God, uh, we have free will. That everyone has the choice." God, smart as he is, uh, he uh, <laughs> he has not determined who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's our choice. That's um, that's the whole basis of of, of why Christ came and uh, and of Christianity. So <coughs> that's right. <laughs> but yeah, 
but according to Calvin, this has already been sorted out. <laughs> anyway, think of all the work we've gone through for. <laughs> we've been wasting a lot of time. Wasting a lot of time. That's right. <laughs> I sure hope that. You know, if, if when I get to heaven, if the Lord is a Calvinist, I'm going to be in big trouble. Uh, you know, <laughs> I say, <laughs> or if he's wearing a turban, you know, that's going to be even worse. I'm gonna, how did that go? Allah, blah, 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 blah. Akbar, I know. I see you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. Uh, I think I'm going to see Jesus. And he's going to say, I'm glad you, you decided to come. <laughs> or something like that. Well done. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. About what, uh, I'm going to talk about his beliefs uh, that are that are absolutely Methodist and Wesleyan, and you'll you'll love it. Uh, and what separates us from Calvinists and from Catholics and from, from others, and, uh, um, uh, is 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 the Catholic spirit. Catholic meaning broad-minded. Uh, is uh, what are we what are we absolute on, and what can, where is there wiggle room in our in our theology? Anybody else? Okay, I'm also tomorrow night going to give a, a soft invitation. I give unpressured invitations. And uh, if you feel led to respond in any way, if the Lord has tugged on your heart uh, or you feel like you need to take a step that you had never made before, I assume everybody's a Christian here. Uh, may not be, but it may be to accept Jesus Christ and ask him to have a personal relationship with you. That's always basic. That's the first thing. Uh, but it also may be to do something that you haven't done before, to uh, be the remnant, to uh, you know, do more than sing on Real Christian Children's Church, say, I want to be a soldier. Uh, I, maybe I don't even know how yet, uh, but uh, I want God to show me. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll give an invitation, and, and uh, I'll just ask you to stand and then while we're singing. And it won't be pressured, but you, you think about that. You to do, brother. I'm done. Mom, my mom was an English teacher. She used to say, "Don't, don't say you're done. A turkey's done. You're I'm finished." I know. Yes, you are. I would say, <laughs> "Mama, I'm done like a turkey." I would say. <laughs> I'd love to Very grieve good. my mom. I think what uh, Lanny was saying is very pertinent. Wesley is claimed at saying, in essentials, we must have unity, we must believe alike. But in non-essentials, we can think and let think we can differ, you know, but in all things, even in the things we disagree on, there must be love. When we disagree, it does not give us the right to become mean-spirited or divisive or injurious of each other. So even when we do dif differ with one another, uh, Jesus told us to love one another, and, and that trumps everything. But there are essentials, and I think what Tom has spoken of repeatedly is if we will allow the gospel to be perverted then the essentials are lost and then we are no longer certainly biblically Christian and Paul was very adamant about that to the Galatians that if there's another gospel if we take away from the gospel and pervert it um, then we have really lost what Christ achieved for us and so there are essentials and we must be clear about those but then there are things that we can kind of discuss and differ on, especially some things that are interesting, uh, speculative. But the essentials, I think Jesus made very, very plain to us. They're not hard to understand, and uh, they're certainly not hard to receive. Jesus has made them very available to us. But he did say you've got to become like children. Simple faith. You've got to surrender. You've got to learn to love him back. You can't enter this kingdom without loving God back. I don't care how smart you are or how religious you are. If God hasn't touched your heart and changed you and made you new, 
Biblically, you're lost and you're going to stay that way, no matter how many hoops we might jump through. But if Christ has truly entered our lives and changed us and made us new, born again, though the, the demons of hell come against us, we will be safe in His keeping. No one can pluck you out of my hand. That's where we want to live, in the hand of Christ. So we're going to sing uh, Victory in Jesus. And I pray that it is our theme song, that we are a part of that victory. Lead us, Sandy. of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing and play the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Methodist faith as a simple faith really for simple people or a common faith for common people Wesley was very educated brilliant really but he discovered that he could speak to people in simple language and their hearts would be touched and changed and they'd come to know Christ and they'd 
be wonderfully transformed. And all the sophistication was sometimes a hindrance. That's not to say that we need to be ignorant. We don't want to be ignorant. But just like I think Tom was saying, sometimes we can get smart and then we become dumb, spiritually dumb. Knowledge or sometimes education puffs us up in a way that we won't believe. We can't believe. We won't listen to God. We think we're smarter than God. What a frightening place to be that we can somehow look at God and say, you don't know what you're talking about. I pray that we would be simple enough, dumb enough to believe God and follow God and love Him back. May that be what God says to us when we see Him, that you learn to love me back and welcome home because that's what it's all about. Jesus revealed God as our Father. When we pray, we pray our Father. And may we see Him when we finally get there as our Father, whom we love. Everything else is details. May you know that we love Him. And so I give you the blessing tonight. May the God who sent His Son among us, because He loved us, and the Son who came to show us the Father's love, He lived it in so many little ways, healing and feeding and caring and then finally bleeding and dying. May that love touch you and me. May it be in you and me. May it keep us close to God and close to one another until that day comes that he calls us home and we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, entering to the joy of your Lord. Amen.